Good afternoon. Kalispera. Thank you for coming. Ευχαριστούμε. My name is Tamatia Dova. I am the chair of the Department of Greek Studies at Hellenic College. And I'm honored to also be a friend and colleague of Professor George Kalogeris, Yorgos Kalogeris, who will be our presenter today. Professor Kalogeris teaches at Suffolk University. He's an associate professor of English, and he is an internationally acclaimed poet. In fact, I would like to suggest that Professor Kalogeris is the poet laureate of American Hellenism. Today he will read to us from his most recent poetry collection, Winthropos, for which he also received the Jason Dickey Award. It was published in 2021 and uh, has been a masterpiece, recognized as a masterpiece of poetic creativity and of the perfect encapsulation of poetic traditions from Mimnermus to Leopardi. I have written a review for this book and when I put it down, I realized that it was the ultimate praise because I just couldn't say anything else. So without further ado, I would like to present Professor Kalogeris who actually is a local. He was born, raised, and currently resides in Winthrop. And as I discovered three minutes ago, he played point guard in the basketball team of the cathedral a few years back. <laughs> so, <laughs> Professor Kalogeris. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay, people way in the back? Um, it's great to be in this, this storehouse of Hellenic culture, um, truly a sacred place. Uh, and it's an honor to be introduced by Stamatia, who I think is a, that rarest of scholars, uh, a classicist who both deeply understands poetry and has a sense of the whole reach of Greek poetry from Homer all the way down to the moderns. So it's... Um, I'm hugely uh, honored to be here, thanks to you, Mata. Um, I'm going to be reading from my book, Winthropos, which is the Greekified name my father gave to the town. And my, I'm going to talk mostly about my father's side of the family today. And um, this is a village that I know Adis knows very well. It's Akubos. It's high up in the mountains, not far from Kalamata. And this picture was taken by a, a drone. Um, I want to show you another couple of other pictures. That's another shot of it. And you get the sense of how steep those mountains are in the back, those Homeric uh, mountains. Um, but the first poem I'm going to read is, has to do with this photograph. Because I was a kid, and I would go into the parlor, and I would see this photograph of my mother's. I knew my father's grandfather because he lived with us for a few years. But I never knew his grandmother, my, my grandmother. I never knew, knew her. Uh, and I knew that, um, well, all I knew is that she stayed in the village of Akubos, and that um, she was there when the Nazis went all the way up to Akubos for whatever reason. And um, maybe or maybe not, I was never sure. Something terrible seemed to have happened to her. Um, it was never talked about. And I'm going to get to that in another poem. But this poem is just about seeing her with her hand on her chest. So it's called Akubos from a Drone. It's not on those sheets. I'll tell you which ones are on the sheets. 
Aquavos from a drone. It's only when I open up the attachment that I see it as seen from above the clouds. My father's village, way up in the Peloponnese. Olympian email sent to me by my cousin Perry, Pericles Christopoulos. Stucco houses clustered against the cliff, terracotta rooftops bright as pistachio nuts, and that sugar cube at the very peak. It must be tiny St. George. Akovos with its olive groves aglow. Akovos is seen by the eagle of Zeus. Akovos is photographed from a drone. But nothing like that snapshot I saw as a child. Whenever I entered our parlor, where it was always Akovos up, up close, but not in color, circa 1940. For all I knew, it was all in black and staring back at me from under the hood of her shawl. I mean that village grandmother I never met, but there she was, ancestral shade, with one hand over her heart. And lo, in the valley of the shadow of our empty parlor, I saw it, the voice of silent lamentation, Akubos from a drone. Um, I'm going to show some other photographs. Uh, my father and his uh, brother, Peter, there was a, uh, two other brothers, but uh, my father and his brother, Peter, they came to America. They were probably, we, we never were quite sure about their ages, probably 17 and 15. And very few years later, they found themselves in the South Pacific. And my father was on the island of Peleliu. And his brother just happened to have a leave um, and was able to visit his brother, uh, who he hadn't seen in three years. And um, they, they met on that island. Um, here's another shot. And they, that, that's really right in front of the sort of bivouac that my father stayed in. But this picture when I was a kid growing up and I was starting to read the classics, this was Achilles and Patroclus to me, these two. Uh, but they, they, um, they opened a store in Winthrop. They were peddlers, fruit peddlers, and they opened up their own store. It was a grocery store. And um, I worked there as a kid. My cousins worked there. It was three families. Um, and there were seven kids. And they were able to put all those kids into college uh, by that little corner store, probably impossible to do today. Um, I think I have some other shots of it. That's before I was born, but that's probably in the, the early 50s. Uh, there's my Uncle Peter in the store. So I want to read a poem now that's uh, has to do with that store. Uh, it's called Peponia, the, the, the melons. And this one is on those uh, handouts. And it kind of uh, I think I, I had some sense as a child about the unspoken trauma about what my father and his brothers had been through and sort of came through in the work that they did. And this is one of those poems. I knew my father had sisters. You know, I, I didn't know, you know, what their life was like and what had happened to them. But here's a poem called Peponia. Honeydew melons swelling their shipping crates. Kept cool and the damp cellar dark of my father's store. Out of sight, 
but never so far out of mind that every so often a crowbar's iron talon couldn't pry open their plywood lids, suspending the nails like fangs. If ripeness is all, it was all in the way I saw the way my father cradled Hipponia, turning them over slowly enough to keep the luminous pallor of their moist complexions fresh, still bright in the long look back through the cellar dark. All in the way he'd never say what he saw, but set them gently back down in their wooden crates. Then every so often, another aura would hover there in the afterglow of a dangling bulb's interrogating glare, which still can make my father's sisters appear, crouching together before a crumbling wall. I mean in that black and white snapshot my mother kept on her perfumed dresser with its oval mirror. And, and those open, open kerchiefed faces staring back from the open fields late in the 1930s. As if a crowbar angled into the dark were leverage enough to release the fragrant, opulent sheen of those who never cross over the water, but hover near whenever I say Pipunya. Honeydew melons swelling their shipping crates. Um, I don't know if you can see that picture in the back, that photograph. Um, that was the only photograph we had of my father's whole family. My brother's kids, when they were growing up, they photographed everything, everything they ever did. This was the only photograph. That was this. My mother's sister, my father's sisters are here. That's his wife. That's my uncle Charlie. That's my uncle Peter. That's my father. That's my grandfather. And that's the older brother who was here. And he was sort of, his picture was sort of photoshopped in. I don't know what the equivalent of that was. But, um, you know, it was this shot of those faces. There's one other shot of them, but that sort of when I was a kid, the haunting photographs and, you know, the Michael Charlie saying that's the first time they wore shoes. It was for this, for this, real shoes was for this photograph. Um, but I want to switch gears a little bit here and read a poem um, that's on one of those handouts. It's called Baby Monitor, a poem about my mother who had Alzheimer's, who died of Alzheimer's. And I want to dedicate it to Professor Dova. Uh, may she rest in peace, recently passed away and suffered the same ailment. Um, baby monitor. She's sound asleep or her Alzheimer's is. I can hear each breath she takes through the monitor I keep on my desk, hooked up as it is to the one upstairs beside her bed. The kind of listening device that's used for keeping track of infants. The tremulous speaker could fit in the palm of your hand. A little green light pulses every time it picks up any trace of my mother's voice. Babble of baby talk and muffled whimpers. Those garbled bits expelled from her speech machine. Its plastic speaker propped all night on its stand, calling out softly some rhythmical ruminant something so automatic it might be dreaming out loud in my mother's oblivious voice. Oh, Sibylline machine, 
that makes the incomprehensible clear. And please help her, and please guide him, and stop it from spreading to the kidneys, please, dear Lord, and make that enough to meet their mortgage payments. And I'm privy to a prayer that, that no, no one else, else can hear, hear. At, at least tonight. tonight. Some, Some primal, primal psalm, psalm where all are nameless, but none of them forgotten. And please, and please, and please, goes the little green pulsing light. I don't know if, why it's not going all the way down. I want to show another, there's another photo that's not coming up. Can you keep going down? There's a couple of more photos. That if we can't get it, it's okay. The photograph is of uh, Mr. Chodos, whose son is here, and his grandson. He passed away not too long ago, but he was, oh yeah, if you can go down on the right-hand side, I'll show you which one it is. Right there. Okay, great. Um, and this one is on the sheet, it's called Classics Illustrated. This is Mr. Chotos, and he was a waiter at Jimmy's Harborside. And I, he was really a second father to me. I grew up, really grew up almost in his house and knew his brothers. And we played basketball together, as Mato said. But he was um, an autodidact. He had taught himself and uh, was a, a wonderful reader of the classics. And he was... Um, he inspired me in the sense that, you know, I, I studied with great classics professors, but it was literature to them. It was a living tradition to Mr. Chodos. And um, he once told me, it's in this poem, it was so stunning to me because I was just starting to be enthralled by the Iliad and, and Homer. And, he's, and this is uh, with respect to to um, Greek Independence Day. He said, the heroes of 1821 are greater than the ancient heroes. And that, you know, I never forgot that. And that was a reminder to me that I had a living tradition that was great, that had greatness in it, heroic greatness. So here's this poem about Mr. Chotos, Classics Illustrated. I don't know if there's anybody here who might remember, this is a long, long time ago, but there were comic books that had the classics. And they were actually very good. Um, and they had Shakespeare, too. Uh, classics Illustrated. So this is one on one of the sheets. Late Saturday morning in my best friend's house. I'm 10 years old, reading the Iliad in the classics comic book version. When Mr. Chotos enters the kitchen, in his waiter's outfit. He's ready for another 12-hour shift at Jimmy's Harborside in Boston, where he'll be shouldering the loaded trays till midnight. For once, he doesn't greet me with Yasu Yodgo. Instead, he picks up the comic book and frowns. Achilles and Hector, he mutters, 
mythologia. And now, in his native demotic tongue, the epic pronouncement. The heroes of 1821 are greater than anything in Homer. And then he rattle, rattles off the Clefdic Hall of Fame. Macrianis, Kolokotronis, Andruzos. Then out the back door and down the porch steps he goes. That Greek immigrant from the tiny village of Kokova who fought against the Nazis. His silver tray as shiny as anyone's shield in Homer. I want to read this poem, Hades. Uh, this one is also on the street. Um, if you grew up as I did in the working class, and my father was an immigrant, and one of the worst things you can do is to break the windshield of the car, which is what I did as a kid. And this poem deals with that. Hades is the underworld, um, uh, of course. And there's a reference um, to Lethe, the river of oblivion, the river of forgetting. Hades. I was trying to hit with a rock a paper kite my taunting cousin was flying above our yard, but struck instead a black DeSoto's windshield. And now my mother stands by the stove, arms akimbo, but face beseeching him to go easy. Just home from work, but still in his butcher's apron, my father kneels before me. Look me here. I lift my head. Beholden to what his index finger won't let, me do, won't let me avoid. Those disappointed eyes, my immigrant father, who never struck me, but whose old world admonitions always left me badly shaken, as if I betrayed his grave injunction, you, my right hand. But this time he winks and says instead, do you like mama to make for you a baby sister, Yodvo? I think I nodded my head, then ran outside. But not before I heard my mother's shriek of sheer elation's laughter, sunlit and soaring. Sometimes in dreams, my father grips my shoulder Look me here, he says, his glasses obscured by smoky grease from the meat, meats or the filth of Lethe. And you, my right hand, so many errant throws, but only one that cracks with a rock, a black DeSoto's windshield, and lets me hear their laughter. My parents down there when nothing breaks the silence. Um, I, don't, I don't need any of these images anymore, so that's OK. Uh, I'm going to read this poem called RCA Victor. It's on that handout. And this, um, this again, is my mother's my father's mother. Um, the poem, just say a few things about it because it is a little bit complex, but my father's youngest brother sent his mother a Victrola record player. She loved music. And uh, he swore to me on his deathbed that the Nazis, when they, they took over her house and, and played the Victrola, and that when they left, they burned the furniture. And when they were about to throw the Victrola in, she resisted, and they threw her into the fire. And we can never 
knew if this was true or not. And so the poem is dealing with all of this. Um, and I, I don't want to say any more about it because I think it's, hopefully it's in the poem. But RCA Victor. And this one is on those sheets. It's the O in Victrola. As dark as the O in Gladiola is golden. Opens the mouth of my uncle Shade, who tells me about the abyss and the ancient brass horn of a record player. The one he sent to his mother in Akobos, way up in the Peloponnesus, whose songs are steeped in open vowels, whose echoes I hear in Polymos, my father's brother's word for war, whose O's go back to Homer, whose gift was the brute operatic music of Polymos. It's the O at the end of Figaro, or a figment of my imagination, allows me to overhear those full-throated officers singing as Mozart blares from the confiscated Victor Victrola. But it's only when my uncle pronounces phonographos, the antique crankshaft revolves in my hand and sets the valley echoing with all those O's. A disc so dark, not even some golden, silver age arpeggios could lighten the shade of the olive groves. It's a month before the plastic O of the breathing tube was put in his mouth. My uncle tells me about the bonfire, just so that I know how the village glowed. It's Germans burning the furniture and some of the houses before they go. It's the muted O in gramophone and my grandmother's obdurate ghost who won't let go of the brazen O of its horn. It's the screech of the swallowed O in Phoenix and the O in the middle of immolation, that smoldering, unmollified O. And now it's the O at the end of Velcro that straps the tube to his open mouth and keeps the dying fable ablaze in my uncle's throat, unspeakable. It's my aunt from Akovos, the only one alive who would know, saying, oh, he, Nazis no kill her. I hear she die of stroke, but me too young to know. It's those rows of oleanders leaning partisan this way, collaborant that, depending upon who swung from them. My cousin Angelo must pass below to get to Ayaya's overgrown stone. The one oblivion's river, however the oleanders hover over the names, flows under just the same. It's the O in the Uzo that Angie pours and showing us her photos, lo, of a date engraved in granite. A date that's later than the close of the war. Yet does it denote the year of death or the atonement of reinternment, dear cousin? We toast your devotion but drink Oblivion's river, smoky as Uso, smoky as the ossified O of the open pit where the bones are exhumed. O record revolving on Clotho's spindle, verse needle at home in the line's dark groove, O flaming, familial, apocryphal tongues, the O in Victrola, dark as the O in Gladiola, is golden, Mozart, sing by Osmosis, O Muse. I should have said that Clotho is one of the three fates. So that's the turning of the... Uh, I want to read an, one that you have. It's called Berlitz, very different tone. I hope it has a little bit of humor in it. Berlitz School of Language. Um, and 
my mother were, my mother's people were from Sparta. So this poem, I think, speaks to the sort of ancient antagonism between the Spartans and the Athenians. Uh, Berlitz School of Language. And uh, this one is, is one of the sheets. It's Vrishi, not Vrishi, my teacher of modern Greek, who came from modern Greece, corrected me. Her accent was subtle, her English British, but her inflection of the demotic word for fountain lacked the shiny sibilant splash I always heard whenever one of the elders said Vrishi. Backwater speech that kept going back to its sources. Village springheads whose rustic mountain tongue still sang to us from the mouth of our kitchen faucet. I was a graduate student taking a quick refresher course when I complained to my mother about her pronunciation. Her people were Spartan. She stood by the sink. And where in Greece is she from, this teacher of yours? And when I say Athens, it's Athens dismissed with a wave of her laconic hand. Oh, I knew it. And then again, the sibilant gush of Vrishi, as fluent as faucet water, washing over the stack of stucco white dishes. It had, took a little bit of pleasure in the word laconic, laconic hand, because that's it, Sparta. How are we doing for time? OK. Um, this poem is called uh, Mavro Daphne, The Wine. Uh, and of course, it has a Daphne in the, the myth of Daphne in the, 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 the name itself, Mavro Daphne. And it begins with a reference to the Austrian German poet Rilke. If Rilke once pressed his hand to the trunk of a laurel, then drew it back, claiming he felt a heart throbbing inside that column of writhing bark and sunlit Apollo still there in pursuit as well. For me, it was squat gallon jars on our cellar floor, kept cool by the damp concrete and filled to the brim with dark red wine that sent an eerie chill through my hands. I was a kid just coming to grips with what I was sent to fetch, and always more still waiting to pour from the cask whose copper spigot kept it in check and doesn't let me forget the bulging oak of the keg just biding its time. Connected by dripping coils to our homemade still, Mavro Daphne, it sloshed against my chest when I carried a jar upstairs, as if its Greek concoction was ready to burst from the airtight cork that was stuck in its throat. But slow secretions came first, impressions formed by an iron clamp, and the ooze that flowed through plastic tubes from purple grapes. Just so, the bitter essence of certain ominous things, like the fate of Aunt Porta's older brother, shot in the head at the end of the Civil War, was being instilled without my being told. But it won't mature to those indelible Rorschach blots on the basement floor 
keep spreading further, becoming my own as they darken flesh and blood. I'll read two more. Um, Because of what's going on in Ukraine, I read this poem. It's written a long time ago. It's in Winthropos. It's called Lvov, when Lviv was, was written with an O, at least in English. Um, and it was a poem. Uh, There's a very famous poem by the great Polish poet Adam Zagievsky called Lvov. And um, he was forced to be a refugee by the Soviets, uh, Soviet Union at the time. Um, but it, it brings to mind my own, you know, people coming in the middle of the night, relatives from Greece to stay with us. It was called Lvov. And the first line is from the Polish poet's poem. To go to Lvov when the suitcases gleam with dew, as they always do, each time I read the opening lines, of Adam Zagievsky's great poem. And then again near the end, when he says Lvov is everywhere, and everyone is a Jew, at least in the moment of leaving their home behind. So too there was dew on those ancient steamer trunks, still held together with rope, too big and unwieldy to angle cleanly through our back porch door. Lugubrious old world luggage, brass hasps and clasps, scuffed up third class freight whose velvet lining, for all I knew, went back to the Ottoman Empire. Strangers that seemed to show up out of nowhere, at least to us kids, and sometimes late at night when all the kitchen commotion woke us up small chips of paint scraped off the jams of the door. Relatives I didn't know from Adam, but there they are in Zagievsky's poem, where everyone comes with some kind of baggage, as if those low, unsettling voices that came from our kitchen would ever be able to tell me how heavy it was. And I'll finish with one more poem. It's called Talking to Myself About Poetry. Um, and I know this one person here was studied with Seamus Heaney. So Seamus appears in this, this poem. Talking to Myself About Poetry. Uh, there's, there's one um, Spanish word, noche oscura, which means dark night. It refers to the dark night of the soul. Talking to Myself About Poetry. Whatever you do, do not give up on it. Keep listening for someone walking behind you. However faint those footfalls, they're not unheard. Trust that your language, lost in the deep dark wood of your larynx, will find another poet's guidance to read you back to yourself and break the silence. Just saying, my heart was in my mouth, Merula. Sings back the nightingale in your mother's voice. Whatever you do, do not give up on it. At the end of another day, with the page still blank, yet the low horizon ablaze like consummate art, who doesn't believe their lines aren't worth a straw? Nobody. Dream on, nobody. At the end of the day, ocean still echoes in earshot of open <laughs> shells. Rosy fingered dawn is under your eyelids. So your words are dead to the world. Let them lie there, true to themselves. As far from the teeming, swarming, inconceivable hives of Mount Hymettus, the poem to come may seem. Just one, not two, mellifluous hum. And there they are, the lyric honeybees. It may be tonight, 
they glaze your sleeping lips with honey of Mount Hymettus. Dream on like disillusioned, sweetly intoning Antonio Machado, music for a mule pulling a water wheel in a dusty circle. Dream on, you are a tired animal with blinders on, but nothing is clearer than water rising and falling an Andalusian song. Remember that poetry was there for you in your darkest hour, that noche oscura when you were 24 and suddenly fatherless. It's when you started writing verse in earnest. Whatever you do, do not give up on it. Keep reading Seamus Heaney and Juan de la Cruz. I mentioned Antonio Machado. He was a great Spanish poet, as was Juan de la Cruz. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. And thanks for being such an att attentive audience. Thank you. It's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I think, I think maybe it was, um, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I think part of it was, um, for the most part, growing up between two languages, since my father spoke very, very little English. And I, I, remember, I remember coming home from school and, and saying to my mother, um, it, was, it was first week of school, and, and I held up a spoon and a fork, and I said, why do you call this one spoon and this one piruni? <laughs> and, and, you know, there, there was like a music in the word spoon, and there was a music in the word piruni. And, and you know, I, I think the choices that sometimes they made were musical choices. My mother's, my mother's parents, um, who lived in New Bedford and came from Sparta, uh, they had a little um, cheese and olive store. They spoke no English, but they, they sang all the time. They sang folk songs, and they, 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 it was a very musical house. So I think maybe some of that sense of, I, I, I mean, I, I think whatever started me towards it was a music, hearing the music of, you know, the sound of Piruni was like a tuning fork, tuning my ear to a different way to say a, a, a particular, ob to name an object. Uh, but it's a great question. What age you are? Your, what age do you sense this? Did I start writing? I think probably my early 20s was probably then. I mean, I, I was fooling around with it before that, uh, certainly. But I don't think I was seriously until, um, until right around the time my father died was when I, I started taking it. Professor, thank you so much. I'm a professor here too. I really loved uh, just ev everything that you did. Um, I have a question about finding our voices as a writer. Um, you mentioned at the end of this final poem to keep reading uh, Seamus Heaney and, and the others. How do you keep your own voice or is it just that reading a great poet unlocks your own unique voice? Or do you read many many great voices, and then somewhere in there, create your own, um, rather than sort of, you know, starting to mimic, let's say, someone else. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the sort of, you put your finger precisely on the, the kind of eternal struggle that a writer has. This is exactly what you're saying. And uh, I, I mean, since I mentioned Seamus Heaney, I remember him saying, um, you know, for one thing, you have to grow up to what you stored up. And I had stored up that image of this, this homemade still that my, my parents had downstairs, this wine still, and that turned into a poem much, much later. So you have to sort of store up things. But I think your reading life and your sort of lived life have to, um, you know, they have to um, cohere at some point. 
And but I, I think it's it's you know you're going to, for me anyway. I, I I mean I always felt I. You know I I I wasn't someone who wrote quickly, and a lot of it came out of reading and and trying to, to find, material in the classical world, and then. This material in the classical world, because I loved it, was had. And if I was very patient with it, it could um, unlock things in the kind of Greek American world that I grew up in. But I, I probably the most important thing I think is is to trust your own material. And um, I was so fortunate because I was a stud student of Derek Walcott's, and this was when he was writing Omeros. It was just before he won the Nobel Prize. And I remember him talking to him about this, and he, he was saying, you know, I came from this tiny island of St. Lucia. It's a tiny island. You know, there's the sun, the sea, there's people. Your own life is as is, is material, as rich as anyone's. And, uh, and I, I think that's, that's true. And, and um, in some ways, I think your, your own material comes before your voice. I mean, I know that a lot of these creative writing pr programs say find your own voice, but I think it, maybe it's more important to find your own material because in the material is your diction, is the way you heard language growing up, and then it's alive. So I don't know if that answers your, your question, but. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, um, I think if I can get it in front of me, maybe I can say a few things about what happened in that poem. Um, uh, I think one of the things, you know, that and I had these, I had these phrases, you know, that these, there's two phrases that were in mind when my father says, look me here. And the, the, it's, it's, it's incorrect syntax, right? But it's exactly the way the immigrant speech was. So that when I, I break the window and he says, look me here. And, and then he says, um, you my right hand. And I knew that I wanted to use both of those phrases, and 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 you know I thought they had a lot of richness, but I think in particular, um, you know, you my look me here brings me to the underworld and to me imagining my father's saying that to me and and looking at him. But I think the phrase um, uh, when I say four lines from the end of the poem. If you can just look at it for a second, those, those last four lines. Uh, I adjust his phrase, his phrase, and you, my right hand. And I put, and you, comma, my right hand. And I'm addressing my own writing hand through, her, through his speech, through his vernacular. And I say so many errant, so many throws, so many poems that didn't, never amounted to anything. But only one, the thing I was happy about this poem is, when, but only one that cracks with a rock, uh, Black DeSoto's windshield, and lets me hear the, their laughter. Okay, so I, the, 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 the incident reminds me of my parents' laughter, but there's one more line. And then my parents down there where nothing breaks the silence. And you know, famously, Hades for the classical world. Does, there's no speech unless Odysseus pours the blood of the um, of the ram and the ewe. So, you know, when breaks comes back, the breaking of the windshield, the breaking of, of the silence. And I think there's a little bit of a rhyme in my parents, parents, and silence. So there's a rhyme, the beginning and the end of the rhyme, and in the middle is the breaking, um, um, which is also a heartbreak, I think, too. But it's, it's, um, it revives them for a minute. Uh, thank you, Marta. Thanks, thanks so much.
Thanks. Dr. Kellagers, I just want to thank you for honoring my father with your poem, Classics Illustrated, as well as bringing a piece of Greek America alive from our hometown of Winthrop, Massachusetts. And uh, your family was the epitome of Philoxenia. And what Mr. Kalajiris' father did and, and the rest of the Kalajiris family, when times were very tough in Winthrop, they would carry many people and many families, and they would let people charge a lot of money in hard times. And many of those people paid the Kalajiris family back, but many did not. But it was nothing to them. They, would, they knew where they came from in Greece and their culture. And uh, I think the poetry, to have you as a poet laureate of America is, is well well received by everybody here, and I wish you the best in the future with your poetry, and may God bless you in your mind, in your great hands, and the way you think, and you'll follow in the steps of Elites and the great poets. Thank you for everything. Thanks so much, Nick. My great childhood friend. I can have a commandeering voice. <laughs> to be here together on the eve of the 25th of March. We know the cultural significance of this event um, for Hellenism diachronically and today. And uh, I think Professor Kalogeris' presence and poetry reading is the perfect way to celebrate the eve of this event and tomorrow. And uh, I wish you many happy returns, Hronia Pola, and please join me in thanking Professor Kalogeris uh, again. Of course, yes. And of course, we cannot escape Presbyteria Chrysoula's pictures. <laughs>